Can you all hear me? Yes. You're hovering, aren't you? You're plenty early. Um, well, uh, in today's technological world, you always have to prepare for eventualities. Yeah, and it's snowing out. It might just get in the way of the uh, internet, you know? It's always possible. How are you doing, John? Fine, Ed. You hanging in there? Turns out I'm a hermit, so I'm okay. You're okay. You've always been a hermit. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> hey, Anson. Hi, good morning. Good morning to you, sir. Uh, do, uh, do I sound loud enough for you? Or am I too loud? Loud enough. It works. Ah, there's Sandra. Andrew, Sandra, good morning. good morning, Ms. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, Sandra, unmute yourself. Thank you. There you go. There you are. There I am. Now all we need to get is uh, Lucy. She'll be here. I permit. I predict. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <clears throat> I wish I knew how to sing and dance. I'd entertain you. <laughs> but nature abhors a vacuum, so I won't do that, you know? Oh, go ahead, Ed. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of changing this, uh, these exercises to uh, skipping lunch rather than learn at lunch. <laughs> as long as my stomach doesn't growl. Be on mute and it won't matter. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Peter, huh? Would you get me? Why does John Christie have no photo? He chose not to do that. Oh. You can, you can, uh, <clears throat> yeah. I've got one, darling. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's see if she's called me. Nope. There's Lucy. Hello, how, how, how is everyone? <laughs> Lucy, good morning. Good morning. Still morning, still morning, yeah. Still morning, yep. So I'm gonna make you co-host as soon as you settle in there. How's that? Okay, I'm good. I'm ready. Consider me settled. Here we go. Great. Does that come through okay? It did, so yeah. 
Should yeah, I just... share my, I wish I had a, a nicer, well, let's see, should I share my screen or no? I guess I'll want to say hi to, I'll, I'll thank mm -hmm. people and then I'll share my screen. But you do have the green button for sh for screen sharing. Oh, yes. Good. Good. You want to test that now before we begin, just to make sure? Sure. Quick on and off wouldn't hurt. I know. Well, I'm just, I'm getting it. There we go. Ah, great. Looks okay. good. Perfect. Yep. I'm going to stop sharing. Yep, good. How much snow did you get, Lucy? Well, you know, I, it's, it, it you know, well, it probably snowed about three inches or five inches, but it melted. So we get, we kept going back and forth. Snow and rain, snow and rain. So the ground is not snow covered. Isn't that interesting? Because we got, we didn't have any rain. We've just got snow. Oh, yeah, that is interesting. <laughs> it's usually the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> and it came from the Southeast. Oh, that's also unusual. Yeah. I guess that's, huh. At least that side of my house was covered in snow. Yeah, it usually comes from the Southwest. I right would there. like some more water. You think it on? So I guess we are, as, as Sue Calloway said, we're lucky we were planning this. We didn't have to cancel due to the weather. Yes, she was That's the right. upside of uh, using Zoom, I guess. Yeah. Hi, Linda. <laughs> Sandra, you look pretty. You're on mute, Sandra. You're on mute, Sandra. She does. I noticed that yesterday, too. I saw Sandra yesterday. <laughs> on another Zoom. Yeah. You looked great then. Oh, I wish I were there. If I were there in person, I'd come out and introduce myself to many of you and see what see what motivated you to come here to come to my talk today. So I'm sorry I don't have that opportunity. You can come later. <laughs> <laughs> or you can tell me what draws what drew you to my talk so I know what background you guys have. That's a pretty good discussion topic for this few minutes before the talk starts. Yeah. I'm here because I've followed the space program since I was a little kid. I remember Sputnik, 1957. Oh, perfect. Good. Great. That's good. I've got that. I've got that in my talk. Good. And now we have a new Sputnik. We have a vaccine, a Russian vaccine called Sputnik. That's right. Yep. Even they know the name means something. Well, you know, the funny thing is, I worked with a um, with a, a colleague who was a academician in Russia, so he was a well honored scientist from Russia, who now lives in the United States um, and married um, one of the Eisenhower daughters in their detente activities, um, and 
he said that when Sputnik launched, the Russians had absolutely no idea that it would have an impact around the world that it did. Um, and they were just, you know, they were just doing their engineering thing and just were totally taken by surprise that it was, you know, monitored and, and you know, every country around the world that could um, detected it, picked up the signal, and then that it had such repercussions afterwards. They didn't know they were first? They knew they were first, but they didn't realize, they didn't realize that, that it was the beginning of telecommunications. Oh. And they didn't have the foresight to recognize what it would, the impact it would have on the whole planet. Well, if we were just a few months behind them, would we have realized that? I don't know. But we, you might want to put, if you're collecting names of people to have come talk to you, you could write down Roald Sagdeev. And I'll put his nope. name in the, in the <laughs> chat. He would be was, great. Lucy, was he in the United States or in the USSR when Sputnik? He was probably a young boy, maybe in college. Mm -hmm. um, and he is Russian, but now he's an American, I believe. Um, he's married to an American now. Um, um, it's really interesting to talk to people who grew up in Russia um, during the Cold War and to talk to them about what their perception of was and, and compare it to ours. It's a, mm -hmm. That'd be a great, it's amazing. Do other people have questions to put in the chat? Three minutes to go. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do is put my hand. Can't decide whether to stand or sit. I think I'll sit. Let's sit and I may have to stand after a while. Susan. So I'm wondering if there are there any um, engineers in the in the audience? Great. Actually, that's yeah, good. Probably. Yes, there's at least one. Okay. Hello. Yes, sir. Oh. Here, I can exercise oh, my uh, hosting capacity. Huh. From the, yeah, yeah. Lucy, That's I have a question. Time. 
And uh, it's uh, time to begin. Welcome, everybody, uh, to today's Learn at Lunch featuring Lucy McFadden. My name is Hanson Robbins, and I'm chair of the Special Events Committee responsible for arranging these Learn at Lunch events. I think I'm going to change the name to, to uh, Missing Lunch Events, but that's all right. <laughs> We're, we're scheduled to have Lucy, we were scheduled to have Lucy speak at Hodson Hall last April, but had to cancel due to COVID-19. Luckily, with Zoom technology, we can see and hear her today. Some housekeeping items before we begin. If you haven't done so, please make sure you're muted when you sign on or have mute, your mute symbol now. That symbol is down at the bottom or side edge of your screen. And you can unmute yourselves at the Q&A session following her presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a chance to hear about the incredible things going on in space from a NASA scientist. To me, it's a fascinating story. I've asked Sandra Jackson, an old friend of Lucy, to introduce her. So without further ado, Sandra, I turn the mic over to you to introduce Lucy. Oh dear. Sandra, you're on mute. Let me see if I can unmute you. No. Nope. Oh, there, there we go. go. Okay. Well, I just thank Hanson and Lucy. Um, so I'll start. Dr. Lucy McFadden is a scientist emerita. Having discovered her passion for the exploration of the solar system at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, where she received her BA. Lucy continued in academia, studying geology and astronomy to understand better the formation of the solar system. She earned her MS degree from MIT and her PhD from the University of Hawaii in geology as seen through the eyes of an astronomer. Lucy McFadden's professional career is broad and impressive. She participated in NASA's first unmanned space mission that landed on a tiny asteroid named Eros. She served on NASA's other robotic missions, one to a comet, the other to two asteroids. She directed programs to inspire students to study science, technology, engineering, and math the STEM disciplines, all the while conducting research, advising prestigious science organizations, and lecturing in the US and overseas. In 2010, when Lucy joined the Goddard Space Flight Center as Chief for Higher Education, she led Goddard's program for students and postdoctoral scientists. Lucy retired from NASA in 2016. Since then, she has maintained her avid interest in astronomy and mentoring young, people, young scientists. And she continues to serve on Hampshire, Co Hampshire College's Board of Trustees. Lucy radiates the joy of discovery. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy McFadden. Oh, I think why, thank you, Sandra. That's a very, very nice inter introduction. And I'm, it's an honor to be invited to, to talk with you this week. Thank you. And I'm just delighted to be here. Um, let's see, I'm going to start. And please, if you, please, I hope you'll have questions along the way and maybe jot them down or put them in the chat if you feel so inclined. But um, in order to keep the flow, I'll um, be, uh, I'll take questions at the end. So let's see, start my show. Oh shoot. Oh, I'm having, already having jittery difficulties. Just a second. Now I'll start, there we go. Play and then share, here we go. Okay, so I'm, um, sharing with you some of my adventures in space today, reflections on the past and future, and I'm focusing on the exploration of 
asteroids, comets, and meteorites in our solar system. Um, here's a preview of what I'm going to of what I'll be talking about. First, I'll start with an overview of NASA, what it is, where it is, and why we do it. And again, my expertise is in the solar system. Um, I think of myself, I say I'm a parochial, parochial uh, astrophysicist because I stay, study close to home. Um, so I'm sharing with you, I will be sharing with you some adventures and stories from three um, unmanned robotic missions that I participated in the Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous mission. Um, and then a deep impact was the name of a mission where we went and explored the inside of a comet. And then I had an opportunity to go search for fragments from comets that landed on the Earth um, in Sudan. Um, throughout my themes uh, of, I, I was privileged to study with people from around the world um, and we shared a common language of science. And I will end with a preview of what's coming up next, which is actually what's actually happening today. So the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was formed in 1958 by the Space Act of that name. Um, and it has its objectives, well, it formed on the heels of the Sputnik launch of October 4th, 1957. And I was going to ask, and I've already gotten the answer, if any of you remember that day, mm -hmm. and um, Ed said he did. Um, I remember being in kindergarten that day, but I don't remember the specific news of that day. But many of my colleagues um, and professors um, were inspired by, by um, NASA that formed in response to the Sputnik's um, first venture into outer space. Um, so, so NASA formed to, um, to expand human knowledge, um, to develop the technical capacity to go into space and to do something in space, not just to launch rockets, but to go into space and do something with that. And I'll, I'll be telling you about my <coughs> scientific exploration um, that was part of NASA's objectives. Um, we're also, the agency exists to preserve the US leadership in peaceful uses of outer space, okay? And it's a, it's a, it's a different, a specific difference between our space program and many others around the world is that they are separate between military applications and, um, and exploration and peaceful uses of outer space. And then um, also among the objectives are for, um, to promote international cooperation and that's what I refer to as scientific diplomacy. And I'll come back to that at the end too, because we're engaged in some of that right now. Um, so the NASA centers are located around the country. There are, are um, 12 of them and six facilities, institutes and laboratories, and they're all marked here with, um, with these stars. You'll notice that they're, they're sort of clustered in, in along the southern edge of our country. Um, and I almost got myself diverted to really look into the history and the political history of the location of these centers. Um, undoubtedly, it was a political move, but um, in order to uh, stimulate activity related to NASA around the rest of the country, NASA also makes awards and grants to universities. And so if I were to plot the, um, the, the location where universities receive NASA funding, I'm sure I know it will fill up, would fill up the rest of the country. Now, just don't worry, I'm not gonna go through this organization chart, but I do want it just to orient you um, to the activities um, shown here in pink are, are the NASA centers that uh, focus on space flight in building the rockets that get us in, that allow us to launch the spacecraft. Um, Kennedy Space Center in Florida is where most of, where virtually all of the launches occur from. The manned program um, at Johnson Space Center in, in Houston, Texas, and um, Marshall Space Flight Center does other activities, engineering activities related to space flight. Now mine, and, and then similarly, aerospace technology, because NASA 
does more than just go into space. They, they improve and develop technology for commercial um, flight as well. Um, so there are these centers in Ohio, um, Southern Virginia, uh, the uh, southwest of, of um, California and Ames Research Center south of San, San Francisco. Um, but my activities have been with uh, Jet Propulsion Lab and Goddard Space Flight Center, the two centers that focus on science, the discovery of, of the universe, discovery of things that happen in the universe, in the solar system, um, as well as the sun um, and understanding origins of life. So, so my, my stories today are certainly not represent, representative of all of NASA, but, but this is where I, I'm coming from, um, a scientist. Now, I'd like to sit with this spectacular image and just give you a few minutes quietly for you to look at it, and then I will walk you through it. But I, it's so beautiful, I want to enjoy it. And I, it will be a few seconds. So, so this, this spectacular graphic um, is really enabled by our space exploration. Um, over on the left, our space exploration of the solar system. I wanna start walking you through from left to right. And this is an image of our sun, which is at the center of our solar system and all the planets orbit around the solar system. I'm sorry, and all the planets orbit around the sun. And I want to walk you through this, this image of the sun is from a, a robotic spacecraft that was um, studying imaging the sun and showing its dramatic prominences of, of gas, gas, gaseous prominences that um, are released from the sun. And the sun provides us all with the heat that um, allows us to be warm enough on the earth combined with our atmosphere. But let me just walk you out through um, starting with Mercury, here's Mercury, Venus, and the Earth, followed by Mars, which is in the, the news this week. And then in between Mars and Jupiter, you will see a, a belt, um, which we call the asteroid belt. And it's a reason, region of the solar system where a planet failed to grow into the size of a planet. And that, that happened, that is so because the mass of Jupiter um, interacting with the mass of the sun um, caused tidal forces um, that prevented a, another body from growing into the size of a planet. And some of, the, you'll see there are bodies of different sizes in the asteroid belt, um, but when the gravitational forces broke them up, then they, then they collided with each other and they, they continued to grind down and we have, there are, there are millions of, of asteroids orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. So my first, um, the first trip or adventure that I'm gonna take you on is to an asteroid um, through, our, through a robotic mission. But let me first give you, keep going through the solar system. Here's, here's Jupiter, the largest planet, um, the famed Saturn with its rings and Uranus and Neptune. And then there once was Pluto as listed as one of the planets, but it's now a dwarf planet because we have found um, in the past 25 to 30 years, many other objects the same size as Pluto. Um, and so we devised a whole classification of dwarf planets and, and literally that way um, students and ourselves included only have to remember the names of eight planets instead of 15 or 20 more of these dwarf planets. Okay, and then up here, I want to bring your attention to this um, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy object, which is a comet represented by a, it's a, it's a comet has a nucleus, which you usually cannot see. Um, and, but the nucleus is a solid material, and then it is surrounded or shrouded with gas and dust that is um, heated by the light, by the, the heat of the sun when it comes close to this comes to the inner solar system. Now the orbits of comets are highly elliptical, 
Um, they spend most of their time out at the far edges of the solar system where it's very cold. Um, and so my second story will take you, tell you about the deep impact mission that went to a, a comet named Temple One. And then finally, I'm gonna tell you of some of my adventures in, in searching for meteorites that actually landed on the earth. Um, because again, Jupiter and, and the other uh, forces from the other masses, the other planets in the solar system, sometimes send some of these fragments out into a collision course with the earth. Um, so I will also ask you to look at and pause at these meteorites, which come, which are on display in the Berlin Museum. And they have, we have been collecting meteorites throughout human history. Um, they, they are fragments of, of asteroids um, that have collided with the earth. And we either see them land or find them as strange looking rocks in unex unexpected places, or we find them when we go deliberately go out to search for them. So meteorites are fragments of asteroids that have landed on the earth. And, and oh, they tell us about the, the history of the solar system from four and a half billion years ago when the solar system first formed when all the material in the solar system condensed into uh, planets. Okay, so now let me start with um, the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous mission. I'll give you a little summary and then we have some pictures. So it was an unmanned robotic mission to asteroid named Eros. In 1996, uh, uh, it was operational between 1996 and 2001. Um, and the internet was just beginning then. And, and we were learning how to use the internet. And that was before we had a lot of um, filters. And so I would go wanna go show people about something about this mission, uh, which was um, built, the spacecraft was built and operated out of the applied physics lab in Laurel, Maryland. Um, and I'd wanna show them the images of what was going on, which I'll show you in a minute. But I used to go to the internet and search on Eros and then all sorts of, um, all sorts of, uh, pornography would come up and it was really embarrassing. So luckily, but that was just a story from the past when the internet was young and before we had our filters in place. Um, so the spacecraft launched in, um, in 1996 around uh, Valentine's Day. And I wanted, we actually got in, went into orbit around at Valentine's Day four years later uh, the mission cost $224 million over five years, and there's a surprise ending. But here's, here's the spacecraft being built um, with two engineers for scale. So it's about, about 15 feet tall. Um, it's about the size of an SUV. Here, here are shown the, the um, solar panels. So every spacecraft has, has a source of power, um, and the, the solar panels uh, provide that. Every spacecraft also has an antenna. Um, that, this is a dish that receives signals and sends signals back to Earth. So here's a, um, there's, here's the antenna actually, but, but it's, um, the, the dish amplifies the signal and directs it to where we want it to go. Um, all spacecraft also have rockets that are used to, and, and engines are used to change its orientation in space. Um, and as I say, this was built at Applied Physics Lab in Laurel. And this was the first mission of a, of a program to get more spacecraft into space more frequently um, and at a lower cost. And so um, the Applied Physics Lab, which, was, which is a, a federally funded research center, uh, usually does um, Navy, Navy work. So this was their first NASA work um, and they had a lot of equipment that they could repurpose and um, get this spacecraft ready for launch at a lower cost than previous, previous spacecraft. Um, so, and that the, the, this first program called the Discovery Program was for faster, better, cheaper um, missions to, to explore space. Um, that spacecraft is up here in the nose cone of this Delta II launch vehicle. Um, and here the, the chief engineer who wanted to get everything done around Valentine's Day, he was a, 
an incorrigible romantic. Um, he, he wanted to launch on, on Valentine's Day in 1996, but due to weather, his, the launch was delayed, so that didn't happen. Um, but we did launch, and in the next image, I wanna show you our roadmap. This is our roadmap to Vesta, I'm sorry, roadmap to Eros. <laughs> um, here's the sun, the center of the solar system. The blue um, ellipse is the path of the earth around the sun. Here's our spacecraft. Um, now the green, the green path is the ellipse of the orbit of Eros around the sun. And in a minute, I'm gonna start a, a, a movie that's gonna show the path that the spacecraft took because we can't launch from Earth and go, there is no such thing as as the crow flies in the solar system. You have to match up. And so follow the magenta path and it will reach Eros on February 14th, 2000. So we got there and took images. And now remember the spacecraft is moving in space as is Eros. And now I'm gonna show you Here's one of the images um, as we approached Eros and I'm gonna run a little video. So here we are watching Eros rotate in front of us. Um, and we can see, I'll let it go by one time, there's, here's a little mound, there's craters. And um, here's one of the images when we pieced everything together um, to look at, to, to see what this asteroid Eros looks like. Now, it's a rock in space. A lot of my friends say, Lucy, oh, what? I don't understand why you're studying rocks in space. Um, but this, thing's, this thing is the source, a potential source body for some of those meteorites that we found on Earth, that we find on Earth and study in, in detailed chemistry and isotopic uh, chemistry to understand what temperatures and pressures this thing was formed under. So going to this asteroid to see how it how it's made, what its composition is, and compare it to the meteorites is a very important step in, in, um, ref, in defining or refuting our theory that these meteorites that hit the Earth come from the asteroid belt. Um, so we orbited Eros for about a year, and then my, the chief engineer um, asked NASA for permission to land on the asteroid. Now, we weren't expecting to do that. If we designed the mission to do that, it would have cost another $250 million for sure. But NASA allowed us to do it. We, here, here you'll see, this is a picture um, as the spacecraft was descending closer and closer to the surface of Eros. Here it's about um, a, a couple of miles above the surface. And so these are rocks, you're seeing rocks that are illuminated by the sun. That's the sun shining from the right. Um, and they're, they're rocks of different size and it's basically like a, a pebbly beach um, on the surface. And the final image, we, we successfully touched down um, and we, here we stopped getting um, data, but this is just noise coming back from the camera. And we successfully landed on the surface of, of Eros. Again, a feat and we collected data for two weeks later, um, again, determining its chemical composition and comparing the ratio of the elements of Eros to that of, of the most abundant kind of meteorite. Um, so here's our outcomes. We, we made it to the surface. We measured the size, volume, and we did, this was the first reconnaissance. I sort of felt like Lewis and Clark in the solar system, going out to see what's out there. Um, and we were celebrating our success at a, a restaurant in Laurel, Maryland, um, and, and we had a table of 15 of us and we heard a big huzzah over at the bar and we asked the waitress, we said, what's going on over at the bar? And the waitress said, oh, I think they were playing beer pong um, where they, one guy took a, beer, a ping pong ball and, and throw, threw it into a, a bottle of, of a glass of beer at the end of the table. And we all looked at each other and said, beer pong, huh? We just played planet pong, asteroid pong. Our spacecraft was the size of an SUV landed on a 22 mile long asteroid, 198 million miles from Earth. So we felt we were vict as victorious as the guy at the bar. So now I wanna take you to the, um, 
the Deep Impact Mission, uh, another in the series of discovery programs. This one was designed and built by Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado. It launched from Cape Canaveral on January 12th, 2005. And we arrived at Comet Temple One on July 4th of the same year. This mission cost $330 million. Um, here I want, this is, this is, we had two telescopes on this spacecraft. Um, here we're in a, we're in a test tube, a, a test chamber um, that when the, when the engineer leaves, the chamber will be um, put down into a vacuum and cooled and we'll make sure that these telescopes will work under the conditions that they're going to be when they're out in space. Because remember in space, everything is cold, um, you know, hundreds of degrees below zero. Um, there's no, there, there's a vacuum in space. So everything that we build has to be tested under the conditions in which they're gonna operate. Now the deep impact mission, um, here's a schematic of, of the spacecraft. This is an artist rendition but here are the two telescopes that I showed you previously that um, are attached. This, this spacecraft is called the flyby spacecraft. This is the solar panel. We're looking at the backside of it. Here's the antenna to send the data back to earth. But this was um, a pair of spacecraft. This is the, the impactor spacecraft, which flew piggyback um, on this until we got close to Comet Temple One, which is shown here. Um, and and we released this um, impactor spacecraft deliberately to crash into the surface of the comet so that we could look at the debris that was beneath the surface. And we wanted to see what the inside of a comet looked like to test our theory that, that comets were made up predominantly of cold icy material from the farthest regions, reaches of the solar system. So um, on July 4th, I was at at Jet Propulsion Lab because they managed this mission, um, and we were approaching the comet. And you know, if you have you, if you've ever driven in the fog, which I'm sure we all have, you know you can see the hand in front of you and in, in your in the fog, but you can't see far away because the your headlights are are scattering the light in all directions. Well, we finally got close enough to Comet Temple One that we could see through the fog, and here is the nucleus of the comet revealed. Um, and it has, there's craters on it. There's some bright spots, which were icy patches. Um, there's a smooth region um, that probably had something to do with the jets. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but we were very excited. We got to see the comet and the spacecraft separated, the impactor spacecraft separated. And we were looking at this. It took, it took um, seven minutes for the data to get relayed from the comet back to earth. So we got our, our first image of the impactor from the flyby. And, and as I said, the flyby spacecraft was gonna fly over, look into the crater after the debris from the impact splash had settled. You know, Just think about throwing a, a rock into a pond and eventually the pond will calm down and you can look into the pond. Well, so here we, Watched, watched in time as the debris from the impact um, was lofted from the comet. And I swear to God, I was watching this in, in this big room with a big wall, uh, a big wall projector. And this is the closest thing to, to a rapture I've ever experienced. I mean, seeing this big, bright, illuminated uh, region. And what were the outcomes of, of this mission um, we, in one respect, we sort of failed because all of that debris did not clear. Um, but, but luckily, one of my colleagues was using a telescope in Hawaii, and he, he was observing that bright material, and he could do a chemical analysis of the dust that was, that was lofted from the comet and found that the dust was made up both of material formed close to the sun from the inner solar system, as well as locations formed everywhere in between and out to the edge of the solar system. Um, so this was a change in our, in our con concept of how comets formed. They formed in a very chaotic manner, formed by picking up material throughout the solar system. And, and it, it changed our perception of the formation of comets. 
And that was the, the joys of discovery. And here on the right is the image um, about 30 minutes or a couple of hours after um, we, the spacecraft flew by and we could only collect data for, for about for a, one or two hours after the flyby because the spacecraft kept on moving because everything moves in space um, unless you go into orbit, which we did not for this mission. So we had a successful mission. It turned out differently than we thought, but we still learned, uh, you know, opened our eyes to a new, uh, new paradigm of solar system formation. And the next day after the impact, we were dancing at Jet Propulsion Lab outside to Bill Haley and the comets. So we had a, we had a, a joyous, joyous day celebrating our success. Um, so in my next few minutes, I want to tell you about an, an adventure I had here on Earth, because those were some of my space adventures. Um, here, um, through, throughout, for the past 20, 30 years, um, scientists have been searching for asteroids in space because the meteorites, we know the meteorites land on Earth, and luckily they're small fragments, but there are, some of these asteroids do come cross the orbit and come close to Earth. Um, and so there is a, a, there's a search routine, a routine search to look for small asteroids that might collide with the Earth. Um, so in 2008, my, one of my colleagues did find a, a fast moving asteroid. And so here's, this is a, an image of the stars, the background stars. So the telescope was moving at the same rate that the earth rotates. And then this asteroid was, whoops, was streaking by, shoot. Um, and when they determined its position, they realized, recognized that it, would going to, it was gonna impact the earth 19 hours later. So we have an alert system. Um, we have a lot of amateur meteor uh, and meteorite groups. Um, we had a, one of whom was a, a was a pilot for KLM Airlines, and he notified the pilots that were flying from Amsterdam to Khartoum, and they actually saw the the um, they saw the fireball landing, um, and they predicted where it was going to land, and it and it landed over it landed in Sudan, and many people saw it, and the the next year later in this was in uh, early two thousand eight. Toward the end of 2008, um, I was on a bus with a, a number of my colleagues, and they were talking about their efforts to go and collect samples from this asteroid that hit the Earth. Um, and I said, oh, I, I'd like to do that. I have some experience doing that. So I went with them on their, their fourth expedition to Sudan. Um, we flew into Khartoum, which is down around here. The meteorite landed uh, about 60 miles from the Egypt uh, Sudan border. And I, I went, I found myself in 2010, um, going to, or no, December of 2009, traveling with, with a number of colleagues from um, Europe and the United States um, to Khartoum. And we started with a symposium at, at University of Khartoum. And I walked into this room and I love seeing all these, all the students and professors but there was something about the space. Um, the space was, had the same design as the physics lecture hall at University of Maryland. Um, and then to my surprise and delight, the students asked the same questions that my freshman students at University of Maryland would ask. Um, do you expect to find the same elements that we have here on earth in the meteorites? Um, that was one of the questions and I get that question often. And the answer is yes, all the elements in the meteorites are also found on the earth, but they're just in different proportions. Um, but so we had our, our seminar, um, then we headed with 25 of these students, no, 50 students in two bus loads um, out to um, our drive north to the Nubian desert. Um, and we drove and we drove and we drove all day and we got to the end of the road and then we drove along the, the um, railroad tracks to the site of our, of our campground where we knew the meteorites had landed because we had images and we knew the path that the asteroid had taken. 
So we lined up, all the students and, and ourselves lined up and walked the desert looking for anything that, anything basically dark on the surface. Cause here, these are, this is the desert, the desert's light. And here, which, what do you think, um, maybe we can ask later, but the question is, I ask my students, um, which rock do you think is a meteorite? Um, usually it's dark, meteorites are usually darker because when they travel through the earth's atmosphere, they, they, the outer, outer part heats up and you get this rind. Now this, might, this is a dark rock, but the edges are rounded and it's been sitting out, out on, the, on the desert for uh, millions of years and the edges are rounded. This one is dark, shiny, and has a, a trapezoidal shape. So it hasn't spent time exposed to the winds and heat of the desert. Um, so we collected um, over 700 meteorites that time, I believe. Um, and the meteorite type was a different one than, we, than we'd ever found before. Um, and so the students not only discovered them, picked them up and collected them, but they helped um, do the analysis, the geochemical analysis of them. So it was wonderful. I had a wonderful experience, um, met a lot of students. I'm still in touch with no, a number of them. A um, number of them are married and have children. Um, some of them are still in Sudan. Others are in different parts of the world. Um, some, some here, some in Canada. Um, but it was a wonderful adventure. And they called me, they called me Mama Lucy. So what's up next? I don't want to take, I want to save some time for, con for questions, but um, it, Mars is in the news. And ha if I hadn't been retired, and if I had a lot, some time, I would have given a talk on Mars to give you backup, you know, to give you background information for what you'll be reading in the next uh, couple of weeks. But on Tuesday, uh, the first spacecraft um, uh, led by the United Arab Emirates went into orbit around Mars. Today, um, China, a spacecraft sent by the Chinese also um, reached orbit. And next Thursday on the 18th, um, a US spacecraft named Perseverance is going to land directly on Mars um, and look for evidence of look for evidence of life. They're gonna and they're going to collect samples. This is a, a little artist conception, but they're gonna collect samples and cache them, put them in a container, and leave the container for later when another, when another spacecraft mission will come and pick up the container and bring it back to Earth for study in our laboratory. And then I do wanna give you one heads up because I have, I'm partial to this mission. So next October, a mission named Lucy is going to launch to the outer asteroid belt and look for um, evidence of organic materials that might have clues to the origins, the early stages of life um, in the solar system. So that will launch next October. So with that, I think I will um, stop and see if there are questions. Oh, I see that there's chats. I can start by, should I st start by answering the questions in the chat? Hanson or Sandra, should I do that? Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, so the first question is, um, why was, oh, what's the green fog below Jupiter? Oh, okay, the green fog be below Jupiter, great. Wasn't that picture spectacular? Um, that was a, a, that was an artist's rendition of, gas and dust in the universe beyond, beyond, the, um, beyond the solar system. So if we were really in the solar system, when you, when you leave earth, space is pitch black, but the artist took an image from another spacecraft of the gas and dust that's, that we see in the background universe. Um, and it was green, let's see, green is usually nitrogen, emission from nitrogen or something. So it was, but it was an artist rendition, but that's a great question. Um, what posed the greatest challenge and brought me the greatest joy? Well, the challenge is, boy, is always learning. We 
things are happening so fast. We learn, we get so much information and data and trying to analyze the data and get it published and peer reviewed and get it into publication. That's the biggest challenge um, because the process takes so long and, and it's just, it's hard work. But if you find some gem in your data, then that's, that's very joyous. And, and I think my iconic moment was seeing, um, seeing the deep impact, uh, the images from the deep impact mission and all that bright debris, the, the fine grained debris that was scattered sunlight that we weren't anticipating. Um, that was just really terrific. And then I also was fortunate enough to, to be able to help the person who collected the spectrum from the ground. Um, I was able to point out some um, materials that I knew existed in, in, the meteorite, in the meteorites that were high temperature materials. And I said, wait, this, this isn't supposed to be here. So I, I, that was very satisfying for me to, to recognize that we were um, seeing material from both close to the sun and far away in the, in the comets. Um, why was Eros chosen? Um, let's see, the, that's a great question. Um, this, the, the, in the 90s, the program called the Discovery Program that was designed to be faster, better, cheaper. Um, there, the way you make a mission faster and cheaper is to um, don't travel so far away. Don't go to Jupiter or Saturn because they're very far away and it takes six or eight years to get there. So travel to something that's closer to home. And Eros has an elliptical orbit that get, brings it close to the earth, closer to the earth than most things, but the orbit doesn't really cross that of the earth. So Eros was nearby and we could get to it. Um, and we could also study it with telescopes beforehand. So that was, that was a practical reason for that. Um, is that you in pink? Okay. Oh, in dancing? I don't know what that was from. I was dancing to, the, to Bill Haley in the comments. Um, oh, why weren't the me Sudanese me meteorites buried below the surface? Well, they landed in 2008. And so we were there in 2009 and 2000 and early, 2008 and 2000, the, they, this, the winds from the desert just went by, but in time they might be buried. They might be buried. Um, so they weren't buried just because we got there quickly after they, after they landed. Um, and, and yeah, on, on earth, most of the meteorites because of rain and weathering, you know, mud, rain, wash away, you often, um, you know, lose, can't find, can't find the meteorites because they do get covered up. Wasn't there a crater when that, when it hit the earth? Well, no, because it broke up. Ah, this is, that's a great question, Hanson. Um, this particular asteroid um, turns out to have been very fragile. And, and when it, when it entered the earth's atmosphere, the pressure of the atmosphere on top of it fragmented it. it so it disintegrated. And then it actually, these, these um, rocks, these pebbles sort of rained down on the earth slowly. Now, another type of meteorite, there are meteorites that are pure iron that represent the cores of once of a bigger planet. An iron meteorite, for example, would not, it would, is not likely to break up. And that would also, would most likely leave a crater on the surface of the earth, like at Meteor Crater in wow. Arizona. So some, some do and some don't, and it also depends on where they come from. The further away they come from um, and the more elliptical their orbit, the faster they're, they're moving. And that creates, that carries more energy in their speed and they're more likely to make a crater. Great question. Um, oh, was the project named uh, Lucy named for me, I, I wish. One of my colleagues, when, when he saw that that mission was selected, all of these missions are, are um, we have to write proposals and we compete for, for the funding that's available for these missions. Um, and when the, the Lucy mission was announced, um, one of my colleagues said, said um, 
Lucy, you're not that old. That can't be, that can't be right. They've got, they announced that it was named after the, um, the archeological, uh, the, uh, the archeological find named Lucy from, from the, uh, from the leakies from the seventies. So I wish it were named after me, but no, but that's how I remember the name of the mission though. So, <laughs> um, Sandra said, oh, wants me to talk about my trip to Cuba with many, uh, with Sandra and, and Susan Bastris and many other people, some of you who may know. And we have our trip to Cuba in February of 2017, 18, um, happened, it was scheduled right after a meteorite landed in Cuba on the Western end of Cuba. And I had the, I had, a, I, 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 talked, I found an astronomer in Cuba and he went and he, we had dinner and we talked about this, the phenomenon and he'd found some fragments of it. And he took me to meet the people who had, um, who had f picked up fragments of this meteor fall um, on, on their backyard. Um, so that was a great adventure. <clears throat> and that meteorite turned out to be the same of a type that's very common, same, just the ordinary chondrites. And, and I was about to try and schedule a, a symposium in Cuba and everything. But when it turned out that it was a meteorite type that we understood very well, um, I, the, the impetus for, for going back and, and working with the Cubans um, in addition to the political situation, we, that, that plan sort of came to a halt. Um, how hot are the meteorites when they land? Um, they, they cool off, um, the meteorites, don't the, the thin, the, the friction, the meteorites get heated by the friction with the atmosphere. And it's a very thin layer that is heated hot enough to, to turn the rock into glass, but it's a very thin layer and it cools off very quickly when it lands. So no one ever has to worry about picking up a hot meteorite. Those are great questions. Any? Any other questions? Are there any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Uh, how many meteorites are we tracking that are headed toward the Earth that we need to be concerned about? Okay. Well, there is there is a well, they're 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 asteroids until they hit the Earth. Then they are a meteorite. Okay. So we're tracking the asteroids, um, and we do we are tr surveying. I mean, there are, there are hundreds, there are millions of asteroids. Um, and when we track, when we find new ones, we, we make an assessment of what its orbit is and whether that orbit is going to collide with Earth in the next 200 years. So we can do computational analyses of the positions of the asteroids and the position of the Earth. Um, so, and then there's a whole scheme of, of whether or not they're dangerous or not, because it depends on how big they are, um, whether their orbit is, whether they're moving really fast. Um, and, and so we have a warning system. Um, and at one point I thought, well, I could talk about the hazards, impact hazards and how we're mitigating them. So there is an effort um, to monitor them. We do have annual or you know, annual meetings to plan, go through scenario planning to, what do you do if you find a meteor, an asteroid that's on a collision course with Earth? And what if it hits, um, is gonna collide in a city? And what if it's big and is not gonna break up and rain down like, like rain of rocks? Um, so we do, we do have planning and scenarios for that. It's mostly, that, that activity is mostly led by scientists and engineers. We do have someone from Homeland Security who joins us um, and we do try and get um, sociologists and psychologists and communications experts so that we are, um, you know, prepared if something, you know, if we do find something that will cause damage. And, and it does, it does happen. I mean, there are, there, a couple of years ago, there was um, meteorites that came through and fragmented, broke glass and windows um, in, oh, it was in like south southwestern Russia or one of the one of the um, one of the stands. Um, so they do they can cause damage. So we we do our best to monitor 
and watch for them. Thank you. I see that Joy had a question. Joy, can you give your question? Hi, oh, I wrote it down in the chat box, but I'm old enough to remember the space race. And so I'm wondering, are we um, all working together now or is there still this competition? Well, uh, that's a great question, Joy. Um, so, the, you know, the, the spacecraft that just arrived at, at Mars went into orbit around Mars two days ago, which is operated by the United Arab Emirates. That was a collaboration um, between the United States and, and the UAE. Um, and most of the Mars missions are also international collaborations because they're so expensive. Um, and so most of it is collaborative. But on the other hand, there's still competition. Um, there was a space mission to uh, Mercury and the Europeans were gonna do, send a spacecraft to Mercury and the Americans had one and the Europeans had trouble um, delays uh, engineering delays and the American spacecraft, our spacecraft got there earlier and the Europeans were not happy about that. <laughs> but, but the Europeans were, was delayed for so long that they got there and, you know, found new things and, you know, were able to build on what our initial, um, our initial results from the U.S. And in the end, we ended up collaborating. So, That's but it's interesting as I, as I mentioned that that I put the, uh, you know, the Americans mission um, is going to collect and cache some samples on Mars uh, beginning next week. And I found myself thinking, because I too grew up during the Cold War and then the space age saying, gee, they're gonna have a sample sitting out there. And I wonder if someone's, if China or Russia is gonna come and pick up that sample and, <laughs> and bring it back to earth. But, but that's just my, you know, my stories, making up stories. So I think for the most part, um, we do work with each other, but there's some challenges and there's also technology transfer issues. So it, it's, it's all a monitored uh, activity. Uh, Susan had a question there. It's uh, written yep. down. Uh, the future of uh, commercialization in space. That's a great, that's a great question too. And um, because NASA is, you know, the government, NASA provides the seed money to develop technologies and capabilities. And they definitely want, when it becomes operationalized, they wanna turn it over to industry for commercial um, applications and opportunities. So we do have SpaceX, um, Blue Horizon, and a number of, of private um, launch companies and space exploration companies. Um, and we're definitely trying to, NASA's trying to generate, you know, hand it over to private enterprise to, because they're more successful at generating economic opportunity. Um, so we're witnessing that with the SpaceX activities, but, we're, but we also witness how, how challenging it is because um, there was a test, test, rock, test launch the other day from SpaceX and, and they wanted to launch and bring it back and reuse the spacecraft um, and it blew up upon landing. So there's, a lot of technical challenges too. So I'm confident that we are, we are moving forward with space commercialization um, and there's great opportunity there, I, I think. And the, and the UAE, they're, they're developing their space program too so that they can have a technically trained um, popula populace. Um, and, and they even say so that they're ready and can do things beyond their um, oil-based economy, petroleum-based economy. So it does stimulate, you know, it does stimulate the economy in many different ways. Are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, Hanson, I have a question. Uh, two months ago, there was a mission where they landed a spacecraft on an asteroid and they were able to get some samples and they got more samples and they could fill up the clamshell that they were filling right. and they were going to bring it back to earth and, and i didn't hear what the analysis well this is uh, that's because it's this was the a mission called osiris rex and it is operated out of goddard space flight center and they they collected it
but they're sending it back to earth and it's not due back for another year or two. So the sample hasn't yet returned, it's on its way. But they will, again, they, they will have, it's like picking up a meteorite on earth, but this, is, this, this time they know exactly which asteroid it came from. And so that, um, that asteroid that they went to, they believe has, and are hoping, has um, some of the original materials for the beginning of, of living organic life on such as has evolved on earth. So they're going to be trying to analyze the organic um, structure and look for, for precursors to DNA or other proteins that, from which life can evolve. But we're going to have to wait another year or so to get those results. OK, any more questions? Well, Lucy, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And uh, I just uh, can't get over. Uh, you had 61 people. Uh, oh. here signed up to watch you, which is a, 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 a tribute to you. So anyway, thank you so much and, and thank uh, you. time to go to lunch. <laughs> okay, my, my pleasure. I enjoyed it and hope to see you all in person sometime. All right. Thank so, you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.